You're listening to 17 Karat K-Pop. For more about this show and my other show enthusiasts, plus to get the latest interviews, K-pop news, album reviews, and so much more, subscribe to the show's free newsletter at 17karatkpop.substack.com. Enjoy the show! Hello everybody! Welcome back to 17 Karat K-pop. Really exciting, interesting episode for you today. Way more K-pop songs than you realize borrowed from other songs. Interpolated, sampled, etc. Or just flat out covered, remixed. So today, you're going to find out the backstories of tons of these releases. Where the OG versions come from, from the most ridiculous to the most serious. I sort of tried to organize these stories by category, which was kind of hard to do, so bear with me if it's kind of clunky, but I will try to transition among 17 main categories. And also keep in mind, I apologize if I misuse interpolate versus sample, I know they're very different. Sample is what I really mean when I refer to overtly copy-pasting the usage of it. Just sort of from scratch, recreating your own version of something, that's interpolation. So if I misspeak, I apologize, but that's the difference. So there is a key difference. So hopefully you'll understand what I was trying to say. Anyway, let's go to the first category, German artists. You'd be surprised how many SM Entertainment artists drew from German artists, especially the trio pop girl group Monroe's. Monroe skyrocketed to fame on Pop Stars. That was the name of the TV show. This was in late 2006. The slogan behind the show was, The country needs new angels. And they went looking for new pop angels and found them in this trio, who lasted until 2010. In 2007, they won second place in Eurovision. They also won second place again in a separate song contest that September. So they were kind of seen as second rate, and their tour sales were not very good. So commercial success was there, but translating into actual concert attendees, not very good. Actually, so few tickets were sold that four tour stops were canceled. One of their big breakout hits, though, caught SM's eye, SM Entertainment, Hot Summer. Hot Summer kicked off their promo for their second studio album, and they basically had the opposite of a sophomore slump. Some artists are considered to kind of have a sophomore slump. More pressure and a failure to live up to expectations on a follow-up release to a debut. They kind of had the opposite, where people didn't expect much from them, and they turned around people's perceptions to an extent. Thanks to Hot Summer, which was picked out of 300, so literally hundreds of options for that album. SM Entertainment girl group, FX, then made it their own in 2011, racking up wins on Inky Gaio, M Countdown. They actually produced a video for it with Zany Brothers behind it, Alexa's company. The music video for both FX's and Monroe's versions, pretty boring if you ask me, to be honest. Just lots of kind of posing and some color changes I guess are interesting. Always just kind of pretty basic. Not really a plot for either FX's Japanese or Korean videos. Actually though the OG video has drawn comparisons to Dance Floor, the name of a commercial from Dolce & Gabbana in the mid-aughts. The B-side that came with Hot Summer was called Scream, which SM Entertainment also made their own. They released it as kind of the opposite of Scream, Daydream, by this project group, Any Band. Which, whoa, what a weird throwback. You probably memory hold this. Any Band had Boa, Tableau, Jin Bora, and Shia Jensu. Boa also did Scream for her English album. My C-pop queen, Jolin Sai, remade it as Hot Winter for the iconic album Butterfly. Rise Bowbridge from So You Think You Can Dance Australia released his own version with new lyrics in 2008. So the aughts were it for this song, remixed again and again. SM saw potential in Monroe way more than that. Lee Hyori has covered Monroe's Show Show Show, and Super Junior covered Monroe's Monster. And there was also the German glam rock influence. There was a six-member band called Cinema Bazaar. They lasted, well, their album debut was 2007, and they announced a hiatus in 2010, so about three years they were active. And here's another throwback for you. They announced via MySpace their disbandment. Cinema Bazaar was another lower-tier artist that SM still saw hitmaker potential in, despite only getting third place when it comes to Eurovision nominations. 
They did, however, open up for Lady Gaga on the Fame Ball tour back in 2009. And then Shiny released Forever or Never, which is a version of a Cinema Bazaar song. And given Shiny's kind of campy, elaborate aesthetic, it does make quite a bit of sense that they would draw stylistically from a glam rock group. Category 2? More about SM artists amongst each other copying each other's work. H.O.T., a classic first-gen boy group, has had their discography repurposed for remakes countless times. From NCT Dream's Candy, to Super Junior's Happiness, to SM Town's Hope from Quanya, their version of Hope. SES has also been constantly having their work repurposed, like Red Velvet with Be Natural. That was an iconic introduction to Taeyeon as well. Not fully an intro, but you know what I mean. A big first moment that got him in more people's radars. Plus, SES made Dreams Come True, which Espa remade. Honestly, I like Espa's version way more, and Boa really was creatively involved heavily in Espa's version. There's a great mini YouTube documentary, actually, about the making of that remake that really is very illuminating about Boa, her artistry, her approach to working with younger artists. Really made me appreciate her even more and see what Espa has to offer that is so unique. So a really thorough effort behind the choreography, the video, the song itself changed to be very, very new, but still pay homage to the original. But I must admit, parts of the OG video I prefer, like the cute little alien. Espa have actually covered a lot. They covered Forever as well by Yoo Yun Jin, but gave it a very glamorous, sparkly makeover. They really add a personal touch, which they also did for Next Level, but you forgot that was a cover. We will get back to that. Then, of course, there's a celebration of Boa's now decades-long career, and to celebrate her career anniversary, lots of SM artists contributed to this cover album, full of Boa covers. There's Taeyeon with Elena's Princess. My personal favorite, actually, is probably Baekhyun's cover of Garden in the Air. Really works well with his voice. Speaking of cover projects, that's Category 3, full-on just cover projects like Red Velvet member Joy. She decided that her debut EP would be all covers of 90s and early aught songs because the agency apparently encouraged it. I hope it was not to devalue or underestimate her solo potential for creativity. And I hope it really was what she said it was, which is they said her voice is really suited for older tracks, which it is. So I hope that is just the full truth. But anyway, she said she was on board because she likes singing those songs anyway. She released a very adorable cover of Hello by Park Hakyun, which became the big title track, with an adorable video and proof that indeed her voice does work well with that sound. There was an interesting Fever Music 2020 summer project, which brought an unexpected pairing together. The song Sorrow by Cool was covered by Ravi, Yeri, and Kim Woosok. Then there's the a cappella group I'm raving about all the time on the show, Narin, N-A-R-I-N, with the remake project, that's a must hear. Then there's the season songs A.T.'s released with Turbo member Kim Jong-kook. A.T.'s released a Halloween surprise with their Black Cat Narrow cover. It's a song from Turbo, but actually it goes back farther. There are two original versions of this song about a black cat named Narrow. One is an Italian children's song from 1969 with a title that basically translates to I Wanted a Black Cat. And it's a pretty whiny song about a kid who got a white cat as a gift and wanted a black one. The second version was also a kid's song, kind of, in that style. A Japanese song called Kuro Neko no Tango. That totally changed the narrative. So the main lyric continuity was just with the references to a black cat. The similarities kind of stopped there, and the Japanese version became kind of a love story about crushing. It got a romantic theme added to it, rather than just a kid complaining. Several Japanese artists over time have released their own versions of this song, including Ami Tokido. Then ATs gave it a Halloween spin with this big performance for it. First on Immortal Songs, and then down the road they revisited it for a big cinematic music video and official promo treatment. 
I love the video because not only was it a great Halloween surprise, but it was very tailor-made to 80s. And they had Kim Jong-kook on board, an OG Turbo member. So it did stay true to the original, but they added so much of themselves to it. The mysterious quality, the lore of their cinematic storytelling, like with the theorizing fans could do over the fact they all have scratches, for example, except San. So he may be representative of that black cat. Symbolism aside, they also really put in a potential hint at deeper meaning with wearing their second anniversary concert looks while facing the altar in that video. And I love that they incorporated both Turbo's choreo and the choreo for Thanks, the AT song, and brand new choreo. So a bunch of new and old merging together, plus an interesting new story and a surprise twist when one of the corpses who comes back to life in the video is Kim Jong-kook himself. So yeah, it went from a whiny kid to a love story to a Halloween mini-movie. What a song journey. Category 4, songs that have been repurposed, remade, multiple times. So it's become a copy of a copy of a copy. Jermaine released a song called The Rain Begins to Fall, which was turned into a Korean trot song by Soul Family. Then it was turned into a song by Sai featuring Hwasa called Now. There was this famous duo, the Jackie Boys. They actually won a Grammy for their David Guetta remix contributions to a Madonna song Revolver. They also worked on Icon's MUP, Got Seven's Just Right, plus Big Time Rushes All Over Again, Sean Kingston, Justin Bieber songs, one version of Jason Derulo's Talk Dirty, Jake Miller's Dazed and Confused. They really ran the gamut. Big prolific resume. The Jackie Boys recorded a song for themselves, presumably, Bad Case, with no other artist attached to it. But Bad Case never came out, and then it went to two artists at once. Somehow it went to both Marcus Houston, the actor and R&B artist, and Shiny, who turned it into the song called Hit Me. Nadine Hoffelt, a South African star who released quite a few albums, also hosted a music game show in Africa. She released English songs quite a bit as well. She released I Can Have You, and FX remade that into Mr. Boogie. Interestingly, Nadine had released this English cover of Yunha's song, Delete, Made Up My Mind. So Made Up My Mind by Nadine is actually Delete by Yunha, and then Nadine's I Can Have You is also FX's Mr. Boogie, basically. Number five, classical music samples. Red Velvet have made quite a habit of sampling classical music, from the Nutcracker in the B-side Marionette, to Air on the G-String in Feel My Rhythm, to George Gershwin's Rhapsody in Blue on Birthday. It's become a trend for them, which suits the interesting, classical, sophisticated, ballet-esque aesthetic they have that also goes with the emphasis on contrast. Like, they have very sweet, sophisticated-sounding songs, but also very sassy lyrics sometimes. So it helps with the sharpening of that duality that they're capable of. Ode to Joy was interpolated as part of the Answer remix from 80s, which is just a really cool, interesting move. Did not see that coming. Then there's Blackpink's Shutdown, which we've talked about the significance of before, but I'll just reiterate. They interpolated Niccolo Paganini with the song Little Bell, La Campanella. Little Bell was a nickname for a Franz Liszt piece. Paganini and Liszt, a violinist and a pianist respectively, were often referenced in the same conversation as like musically equivalent virtuosos in the mid-1800s. And Liszt really admired Paganini. Liszt really wanted to take after him. And Paganini seemed to give a nod to Franz Liszt with the song Little Bell. This is extra interesting considering that Franz Liszt is the reason for the term listomania, which was basically a term for fangirling before fangirling was a thing. Like, one of the original forms of fan freakouts was over Franz Liszt. People were doing, at the time, unprecedented, never-seen-before stuff to get his affection. So Blackpink are basically reasserting how iconic they are by paying tribute to the OG of super fandom status. Number six, James Brown. 
aka the godfather of soul, who has influenced so many K-pop artists, James Brown truly revolutionized funk music. What funk means. He was a popular soloist and band member of the Famous Flames, and one of the very first ever, 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 Rock and Roll Hall of Fame inductees. James Brown's song, The Payback, is sampled in Chinese Sherlock. The Payback is a super iconic choice. That was one of the key songs, emphasizing his role in solidifying a redefining and clarification of what funk music is. Another classic, of course, I Got You, aka I Feel Good. And that title of the song basically became the inspiration for his I Feel Good Inc. idea. In his will in advance, he wrote out, I want most of my remaining money to go to establishing I Feel Good Inc., a company to offer scholarships and other aid for disadvantaged kids. Block B's Nalina borrows from I Feel Good. EXID for Hot Pink took from his song Get on the Good Foot. August D in that self-titled track samples It's a Man's 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 World in the intro. That song became part of an iconic James Brown tribute at the 49th Grammys. And then their sisters Shake It, which actually uses two separate samples. Very different songs, Lucky Star by Madonna and Funky President by James Brown. We could spend a whole other podcast episode talking about that song. It was composed right after Nixon resigned. Lots of context there to unpack, but that's beside the point of today's episode. But an interesting topic to revisit, so maybe I will in a future episode of Stay Tuned or something. Let me know if you'd be interested to hear more about James Brown, because he truly has influenced way more artists than you realize. So has Missy Elliott, which brings us to Category 7, The Worlds of Rap and Hip-Hop. Missy Elliott worked with Pharrell Williams on WTF, which became part of DDD by EXID. She also was sampled in Mic Drop by BTS, Missy Elliott's song Get Your Freak Out. BTS have always been influenced by old school rap and hip hop. Of course, they became known for turning J. Cole's Born Sinner into Born Singer, which has been out for years unofficially, but the studio version premiere was just this past year. And it made for a cool full circle moment to follow that official release with J. Cole actually teaming up with J-Hope for On the Street. What a full circle moment. Speaking of J-Hope, What If is a song that samples, I can't say the name of the artist, on the show, but if you know, you know, Shimmy Shimmy Ya, which helped this Wu Tang clan founding member who goes by a name I can't say on the show, it helped him go platinum with his first solo album. J Hope and Becky G paid tribute to Webstar and Yun B's Chicken Noodle Soup. This song went super viral because of the dance people were copying from YouTube in 2006. Then it got a 2019 remake from J-Hope and Becky G. Interestingly, and I'm not sure if this was a coincidence, but the OG and the remake version both came out in September. And one of the OG artists, Young B, aka Bianca Bani, raved about their version and seemed extra grateful just that it was getting people talking about her, showing her gratitude for her musical influence. And she kept posting on Instagram her excitement over hashtag thank you Bianca trending on Twitter. Maybe over 10 years too late, but trending nonetheless. More from BTS paying tribute. Come Back Home was originally by Sataiji and Boys. Super fitting for those legends to cover those legends, because they both kind of paved a future for K-pop in their own ways. Sataiji really laid the groundwork for adding certain elements to their work, subverting fashion expectations, dance expectations, sub-genre expectations, they brought into mainstream South Korean music way more subgenres than ever. They kind of also just ignored song censorship guidelines run by the major networks. So both groups really have always from the get-go tried to distinguish themselves, march to the beat of their own drum, and basically thumb their nose at the conventional way to do stuff. Just full of social commentary and rejecting the status quo to be themselves. So BTS fittingly took up the mantle and became part of the 25th anniversary celebration of Sataiji and Boy's career. Quick fun fact, actually. Sataiji drew from Kim Minki, 
an artist who was very more broad in his political swipes, but Sataiji took things in a more narrow youth targeted direction. But that way of messaging, they were inspired by. A British hip hop group, Blazin Squad, released a song called Flip Reverse. Which actually was so big and successful, it led to the renewal of Top of the Pops. Blazin Squad was actually kind of panned. Having never lived or even visited Britain, I can't truly tell you what the connotations are with the words used to describe them, but I believe they're derogatory. Anyway, Flip Reverse was a big moment, and Jane Woo Hyuk took that song and made his own version under the same title. Number eight. Interesting Disney Channel connections. This is one of my favorite stories. It's just so surprising and funny to me because I actually heard Corbin Blue's song deal with it first. Because I was into K pop starting in like 2017 ish. I was way younger when I was already into Corbin Blue and anyone else who was in high school musical. I followed their careers religiously. Love those soundtracks. Ashley Tisdale's He Said, She Said era. Let's talk about it early favorite. Anyway, I was really into Deal With It by Corbin Blue and felt like kind of a weirdo for it. Thought no one had heard of that album or it was just too obscure. People were not talking about it enough. Then I got into K-pop and heard Shiny's Juliet and I was like, hey, they ripped off Corbin Blue and I'm probably the only person who will ever notice. Uh, turns out no. It was made no secret that they did buy that song. So they weren't like plagiarizing. They had permission to do their own version, but it was quite a twist to learn that because I was like, I'm pretty sure I'm one of the only people who heard Corbin's version first, not the other way around. But anyway, very odd turn of events. SM also, I guess, has ties to Hollywood Records, which does a lot of deals with former Disney stars, former and current ones, because they acquired Jordan Fisher's All About Us without telling him. And then it was remade as NCT 127's Fly Away With Me. Now this time I actually heard the NCT version first, then realized the Jordan Fisher song existed. So actually no offense to Jordan, but I think the Fly Away With Me song actually really helped promote his own song, All About Us. It got more people to realize it was out there. So he actually was tweeting about it in his confusion. But he was making a big just statement about not the artist, but the management, leaving him totally out of the loop. Like, he had no idea his son had been sold, let alone to a South Korean company. Who knows if he even knew who SM Entertainment were. He just woke up and got notifications like, hey, I think this group ripped off your son. And no one had told him anything about the behind the scenes. Total lack of communication. Very, very strange. Number nine, more movie and TV show connections. Starting with Shiny again, Love Like Oxygen is actually from Martin's Show the World. He was the winner of the X Factor Danish version. More SM Entertainment emulating others with Espa's Next Level, which was actually from a Fast and Furious soundtrack for Hobbs and Shaw. SM heard the song and they approached the artist Ashton Wilde to do a remake for them. Did not see that coming. But this one is my favorite because it gives me an excuse to talk about one of the best horrible movies ever. It is the funniest, corniest thing. Like Camp Rock level corny, Camp Rock level bad but entertaining. Who remembers From Justin to Kelly? The movie starring Kelly Clarkson and Justin Guarini. Right after their American Idol season ended, they were contractually forced to do this movie and didn't want to, but they did. It was super corny from... The song titles to the plot, super generic, so bad. It was really like Camp Rock on steroids. And it's wonderful in how bad it is. Anyway, From Justin to Kelly was a rom-com in 2003. It was a box office bomb. It earned less than $5 million at the box office on a $12 million budget. So yikes. Apparently some American Idol contestants from their season visited on set, but then left and did not make cameos in the movie. Good choice. They were named a Worst Musical Recipient from the Raspberry Awards, the Razzies, in 2005. It was just so good and bad. It was so bad it was good. It's so comical in all the ways it did not intend to. And I have to just do this aside because when do I get to talk about this terrible, wonderful movie besides now? So... The plot, I'll give you the summary so you don't have to watch, but it is so funny. 
it starts out where this girl Kelly, she leaves her waitress job in Texas. She needs to go to Miami for spring break to get away from it all. How original. On spring break in Miami, she encounters Justin and his friends, who includes this guy who's just an idiot, and he moons them and gets a ticket for it. It's like a running joke throughout the movie that he gets ticketed for stuff. Gambling, holding an event without a permit, etc. Kelly and Justin finally get to have alone time at a party later, and so she gives him her number, but he doesn't catch it, and it falls in a puddle, so he can't see her number. It was written on a napkin and just sort of bled. Like, she has this flirty, here's my number moment, and then it falls in a puddle, and so he has to ask her friend for her number, but this friend is gonna sabotage it because she's jealous, and so she gives him her number and says it's Kelly's. Later, Justin fights with this other guy, Luke, over Kelly, and then they decide we'll settle this, like men tend to do, a hovercraft race, during which Luke gets injured. Kelly eventually finds out her friend Alexa, friend in quotes, was texting Justin behind her back. Alexa admits, yeah, I was wrong to do that. I'm really sorry. I shouldn't have acted out of jealousy over how much attention you were getting from Justin and how much attention you always get from the guys around us. I'll make it up to you, and she plans a special romantic dinner for them to reconcile. So she caused the mess, she vowed to clean it up. Good in theory, movie plot-wise super corny. The movie ends where they all come together, their separate friend groups, and dance to That's the Way I Like It at a pool party. It is so high school musical too. Anyway, what does this have to do with anything? The soundtrack had a song called Timeless, how original, and this song actually was part of Justin's Outside of the Song Soundtrack album too, and it was recreated by Shia, X-I-A, and Zane Leon. Not sure why they took a song from from Justin to Kelly, but they did, and I kind of love that they did because it's an excuse to talk about this iconic in the worst and best ways movie. Number 10. Parallels that are less overt. Hard to ignore parallels that may have not been intentional. First of all, the first few seconds of Dear Sputnik by TXT are the same intro as Basquiat by Pentagon. I also sense a similarity with If You Do by Got Seven's intro and the intro to Take Me Home by ATs. There's a sample that I really tried to research and track down, but truly don't know where it came from. So if anyone knows, let me know. The same sample that is used in ATs's Dancing Like Butterfly Wings is also in Childhood by Very Very. And then there is Peary by Dreamcatcher. And I've heard that instrumental, that whistle, that flute, in a lot of songs actually. Latest in I Chillin's new song, Alarm. I kind of hear a distorted version of it with the pacing changed up a bit. But the root of it is still that Peary by Dreamcatcher instrumental, I think, in Meme Tokyo song, River's End. Number 11. J-pop, C-pop, P-pop, etc. meets K-pop. Super Junior have actually kind of run the gamut. They've done original Latin pop releases with stars like Leslie Grace and Reich. Sorry if I mispronounced that. They also worked with Filipino star Nina with her discography for What If. And they also released Believe, a song originally by the Japanese group Exile. There's iconic J-pop girl group Morning Musume, who released Love Machine, that then became After School's Dream Girl. Lastly, Vix made their Taiwanese market debut with a cover of Destiny Love by Harlem Yu. Number 12, as mentioned before, Latin inspiration. Before Despacito, way before he released Despacito, Luis Fonzi released Keep My Cool, which became Boa's Spark. Alejandro Sanza released Isi Fuera Ea. Isi Fuera Ea, so beautiful. Every version. Love it so much. Joan Hyun sang it for a shiny album back in 2008. Ki Hyun from Monsta X made it his No Mercy audition song. Knocked it out of the park. I love watching that audition. One of my favorites of all time. The shocked looks on the artist's faces as he auditions with that and literally is like on his knees. So pained. He just emotionally went there. So good. Q Hyun from Super Junior sang it on The King of Mass Singer. A ton of artists did in 2017. That was a big revival year for it. It has really just had many lives. If you're curious, some English titles for it include And If It Were She and And If She Were the Chosen One. 
Then there is VAV's cover of Senorita. Okay, this is not really a Latin influence except the title. A German rapper originally did it, K1. He never got super big, but he did win rap contests, the biggest in Germany. Commercial success, though, kind of lacking. So VAV, I think, really did expand who knows about him. Number 13. Songs that made the artists super successful, despite not being their own. Like, really just incredible success, and turns out it wasn't even theirs. IU's best-selling single of 2014 was a cover. The Meaning of You by Kim Chain Wan. Vix had massive success with REF for Love Equation. They got a Mama, Song of the Year win, a music show All Kill... Luckily, REF did sign on to this and actually worked with Vix as they made their own version of this 1995 hit. Number 14. Nursery Rhymes, besides the Black Cat Nero one. Because there's one more we have to talk about. A song that provokes a weird nostalgia and mixes Young Dumb Stupid. I will save you hours of Googling to tell you what I finally found out, which is that the song that was stuck in my head was the nursery rhyme, Frere Jacques, which is interpolated into Young Dumb Stupid. I was like, what is this familiar song I've heard all my life? It's got to be a classic. It was Frere Jacques. Actually, Jacques, or Jacques, as in some versions for the syllable count's sake it's pronounced, it doesn't translate to John. It translates to James or Jacob. But the song became Brother John instead, like Friar John. It's really originally a nursery rhyme, kind of. It's about oversleeping. Like, it's time to bring in the bell and wake up this guy. Brother John, are you sleeping? I can't be the only one that, for some reason, was tripped up for a second thinking it was London Bridge has fallen down. Because it's not, but for some reason at first, the Frere Jacques cadence reminded me of London Bridge has fallen down. Anyway... Brother John was actually a very, not controversial song so much as a quizzical one. Like, scholars have debated forever what it was really about. Was it a joke? Satirical? Was it making fun of monks? Was it pro-monk? Was it against a different religion? Was it a critique of sloth, of laziness, oversleeping? Was it just a wake-up call, literally? What was this intent? No one really knows. But Emmick sure took it in a new direction for Young Dumb Stupid. Number 15. SNSD Girls' Generation have used so many other artists' work and made it their own. This extends to subunits too. Holler by TTS was a cover of Hello by Ms. Rock. They borrowed from Duffy's Mercy and made Dancing Queen. Mercy was actually originally about sexual liberation, and Duffy considered it quite autobiographical, so that's an interesting one to borrow. It was a VH1 staple. It won Son of the Year at the Mojo Awards. Duffy's Mercy is one of her most iconic ever. It even got a special honor after it was played on US radio and TV over three million times. Another classic they took from The Boys of Summer by Don Henley. This is a less direct comparison, but The Boys of Summer helped inspire Into the New World. The Boys of Summer has been kind of inspired and given new life to a lot of different artists' work, from a cover by rock band The Adderis to Spanish artist DJ Sammy. Actually, it was going to go to Milk, M-I-L-K, the K-pop girl group. They had their own separate choreography ready and everything. Then it went to them, like, a year later. It had been all ready to go. And it led the group to fame on M Countdown... It was also a big choice for Finding Momoland, Idol School, other evaluation competition shows. It then got turned into a ballad, not so much for mixing things up as for necessity, when star Jessica left the group. And the ballad version then became part of competition shows as their evaluation song, like on Produce 48. Then from S9, brought a new gen spin to it for M Countdown special 600th episode celebration. Truly, it became a soundtrack for a huge range of events. So many different 
political and social movements have turned into the new world into a staple. From women's rights movements to pride parades to the candlelight demonstrations as they were known in South Korea back in 2016 and 17. There were the Thai protests of 2020, 21, for which Korean fans actually helped translate lyrics of Into the New World for the Thai fans who were protesting the monarchy structure there to sing along to. So it's become quite a chameleonic protest anthem and a come as you are celebration song really powerful. And this is a good time to reiterate, I'm not making this episode to say, look at all these copycats. I'm saying, look how cool it is that we live in a world where people are so inspired by each other. All the different ways we can take an art or an artist's work and make it our own and make it carry a whole new meaning. So I'm not dissing us some entertainment when I say they use a lot of samples and stuff. That's just their strategy. They use a lot. And I'm not saying it's a bad strategy. I'm just saying that is the case out of the main K-pop companies with sampling, interpolating, etc. SM Entertainment, for sure, most commonly does so. So Girls' Generation has taken from so many classic artists and a more recent artist because Run Devil Run was an original demo for Kesha in her dollar sign days. And I can totally see it and hear it, not just because the demo leaked, vocally in Kesha's world. A good home for Girls' Generation too, but actually, I could see it being in Kesha's wheelhouse. She also recorded a song called Chain Reaction that then went to Girls' Generation 2. Interesting, I wonder if since that era, they've been in touch with Kesha at all. Like, maybe there are more Kesha demos that turn into K-pop songs. You never know. Lastly for them, we have to talk about the song called Girls' Generation that inspired them completely. This song came out in 89 by Lee soon He actually debuted a few years earlier in a rock band, Buhua. Then Maya covered it two years later, Girls' Generation. And don't worry, Soon Chul is very much on board with them making this whole song their brand, basically. He even performed it with them on M Countdown. So all good, no drama here. The song was totally rearranged by Kenzie, who has an extremely long resume. She's a very busy in-house producer for SM. Number 16, super out of left field ones. Ones where it's like, whoa, not in a million years did I see that coming. One I cannot get direct confirmation on, but some fans are saying there's a famous Punjabi wedding song that seems to be what was borrowed from for Orange Caramel's song, Catalina. Zexkis made a really weird choice and covered themselves. They released the song Couple, which is kind of funny accidentally. They released a couple of the song's couple. Taman's Press Your Number was originally a Bruno Mars demo, but Taman actually ended up writing his own lyrics for it, so it had a whole Taman spin, but I'm very curious what Bruno Mars's lyrics were like. Boy, that song fits Taman, though. I can't even imagine. Okay, I can't imagine. Maybe they should link up someday. Then there is Size Daddy, which samples I Got It From My Mama by Will I Am. It's great proof that YG Entertainment never changes and they just like to push back release dates forever because this was being amped up as a big quick follow-up to Hangover. Daddy was going to come out right after in 2014. Then YG released a statement in July 2015 saying, finally, Daddy is coming. Then it came out in November. Very them. Very YG. But anyway, it was super panned by critics. Like, what the heck is this? But it's still one big. With the Triple Crown on music shows and at the Gown Chart Awards, it became Song of the Year. It was also added to Just Dance, the video game, in 2017. Everything else that I couldn't put in the other categories. Your big miscellaneous roundup of interesting remakes. Brown Eyed Girl's Sixth Sense samples Elephant Love Medley from Moulin Rouge. One of TVXQ's most famous songs is Merotic, which is actually a cover of Under My Skin by Sarah Connor. Hala by a Danish star, Muhammad Ali, was covered by Shiny as Hello. G-Dragon was accused of copying Flo Rida's Round and Round with Heartbreaker. There are some similarities, but all good between them, and Flo Rida eventually even jumped on a remix of Heartbreaker and performed with G-Dragon. Besties Excuse Me borrows from Inda Club by 50 Cent. Shiny samples Cupid by 112 in a very interesting way with the chorus that they took from for Good Evening. 
Baby Vox Borrows from Play by Jennifer Lopez. IOI covered What a Man by Salt and Peppa featuring En Vogue. TO1, quite recently actually, released their version of Hug by TVXQ. Big Bang Sunset Glow was actually originally by Lee Moonse. Hayes released on a rainy day her version of a song from the boy group Beast, which rebranded to Highlight. Precious Love by Twice was actually by Park Ji Yoon. Ives After Like interpolates I Will Survive by Gloria Gaynor. BTS's Coffee is actually a remake of Cafe Latte by Urban Zacapa. B2B's Second Confession is a remake of G.O.D.'s One Candle. Oh My Girl released Ah Ing, which is their rendition of Papaya's Listen to My World. Kara released a cover of Finkel's Forever Love. Zana's A Sanctuary of Love was incorporated into Cheer Up by Twice. Think About It by Lynn Collins has been sampled in over 3,000 songs, including Ah Yeah by EXID. Lots more sampling from Shiny we could talk about. Dance Tonight by Lucy Pearl is part of Replay. Love's Way by Shiny is their version of Too Much's song, Hard Time. RGP released Beautiful Girl, Singular, which is their take on Beautiful Girls Plural by Sean Kingston. Brian Ju covered Jason Derulo's In My Head. G-Dragon covered This Love by Maroon 5. Twice covered I Want You Back by the Jackson 5 for a Japanese movie. They had such a cute twist to it. Exo's Overdose borrows from Labyrinth's Earthquakes. And Love Shot was thought to plagiarize Louis Tomlinson and B.B. Rex's Back to You. But actually it turns out Louis was just an uncredited writer on Love Shot. SM The Performance remade Zed's Spectrum. Jailhouse Rock is sampled in Critical Beauty by Pentagon. Wonder Girls in Tell Me sampled Two Hearts by Stacey Q. Insomnia by Craig David became Insomnia by Wee Sun. XL's Kizuna became Super Junior's Keep in Touch. For You by Fly to the Sky is also For You by All to One. Super Junior's Twins slash Knockout, that was originally by Triple Eight. Devil by Max Chainman is actually by a Swedish artist, Alex Runo. Kai's Rover is a remake of Mr. Rover by Dara. Round and Round by Tiara was originally by Nami. Now by Wonder Girls was originally by Finkel. I Use Last Night's Story was originally by So Bingcha. Lastly, TXT's Fairy of Shampoo is the cover of a song by Light and Salt. I mean, I could go on for hours. So many more, but this is what I could think of while making a list. So if you have more contributions you've heard or speculate were borrowed, whether or not the artist knew it or not, feel free to send them to me. I can shout them out, talk about them, debate them, whatever, on future episodes. Remember, you can comment on this episode or another directly in the comment box right there if you're listening on Spotify. Otherwise, message me on socials. This is all I got for you today. Exciting interview coming up, so stay tuned. Thank you all for listening, and I will talk to you all again very soon. Bye, everybody!